So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Sustainable Finance Workshop, a partner event uh, of the EU Green Week. I'm Christina Deligiani, the co-founder and managing director of Bear Impact and an EU Climate Pact ambassador. In line with the European Year of Skills, the partner events to the EU Green Week 2023 will focus on the topics of skills for sustainable, resilient and social fair communities. So uh, we have uh, chosen the topic of sustainable finance for a general audience uh, with speakers from different sectors, banking, policy making, the investment world and the impact investing the uh, charitable organizations who will be focusing on sustainable finance and investments. Um, we have a great um, a cohort of speakers with us. Uh, Mr. Spiros Kupel is the director of the Institute for Sustainable Development at the European Public Law Organization, an international organization. Um, Dr. Haris Labropoulos, uh, the president of the Hellenic Development Bank of Investments in Greece, HDBI, will be talking about the sustainable finance and its mechanics. Ms. Teresa Farmaki, uh, nature-based investments from Astarte Capital, will be talking about the innovation ecosystem and sustainable finance. And last but not least, Mr. Nicolas Caridis, the program manager of the People's Trust in Greece, a charitable foundation, will be talking about social entrepreneurship and sustainable finance. So uh, some housekeeping rules before I give the, flo the floor to Mr. Kuvelis. You can use the chat to pose questions. And if time allows, we will be taking your questions addressed to speakers. Um, uh, the, uh, the webinar is recorded and we'll be sharing a recording after that. Uh, please uh, do, um, do pose as many questions as possible. And uh, just a little note that this is also an event that has been en endorsed by the EU Climate Pact. So, uh, Mr. Kuvelis, the floor is yours. You also have a presentation to share on uh, the introduction to sustainable finance and what ESG is. Thank you very much. Uh, before I take the floor for my presentation, let me just clarify that I had been struggling for a minute or two to let everyone reach and be able to post on the chat. I think now it is okay because i see people being able to do this so if you have any questions or points you want to share please do so and without taking any more time i will share my presentation with you uh just give me a second so i open it in full format okay so as christina said i am the director of the institute for sustainable development and this is a presentation that is jointly developed with Ver Impact, which is the uh, tool and methodology for ESG assessment that our institute in collaboration with Ver Impact, the company Ver Impact has developed. What we will be speaking about uh, is about ESG and how this is a defining um, point, let's say, in how, how the whole process works in terms of sustainable finance and investment and why businesses need to be engaged in this process, both in ESG and also to be able to access sustainable finance and investment. Um, I will start from the basics because I was thinking while I was preparing my presentation that when you speak about sustainability to people, you get a lot of different replies if you ask them what sustainability means. Some people think that this is only related to climate change or to renewable energy. Some other people tend to think that this is more related to the third world, to developing countries, to poverty and hunger and so on. Uh, so I thought that we might uh, benefit from taking a global view of what sustainable development is about. This definition that you see on your screens, I hope you see on your screens, is uh, the one that was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1987. And it says, for those that have not come across it before, that sustainable development is the one that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs meaning that we need to make sure that we do cover the needs of the present in terms of food, of health, of um, energy, of anything, but without uh, taking too much so that we compromise the future. And what is interesting in this is that this was the first time in terms of legal uh, definition of things that the across the generations, the cross-generational um, notion of rights and of, of law has been established. Until then, it was each generation for its own account, and it was the first time that we started looking into the uh, development process through time. Uh, you may also have seen that sustainable development 
is considered to be the one that brings together the three uh, pillars of sustainability. So you have the environment, the planet, if you like, environmental variables, you have society, the people, so social variables, community, education, and so on. And also you have the economy, all the profit, if you like, the uh, potential to create livelihoods, to create uh, profits and to create uh, materials and so on. Only when all three of those meet together, we can say that we have sustainable conditions. If we have only two of them, we have different conditions that might be bearable, that might be equitable, that might be viable, but they're not sustainable. And in order to understand how we came to need a definition for sustainable development, I will show you a couple of pictures and some basic facts. What we see here is a picture from the uh, International Space Station. And what we see is exactly here, the Gibraltar Strait. This is Spain. Um, this is Morocco. This is the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. And what we can see in this picture is uh, uh, how much dispersion we have in terms of energy grids, of highways, obviously, connecting these places. But imagine uh, if we had been in a position to take the same picture from exactly the same spot 100 years before. This is a picture from, uh, I think, 2010. Imagine if we had the possibility to take a similar picture with uh, the spaceship who had one in 1910, all of this would have been dark and there would not be any networks, no, no grids, no highways, no nothing. And it's very interesting to realize that this whole development has happened in less than 100 years. And one of the reasons why this happened was this. Uh, people realize that there is a lot of energy that is captured in fossil fuels. So we started burning in the beginning coal, and then we started burning um, other types of hydrocarbons. So uh, we were able to use a lot of energy that was condensed. Until then, it was only the energy that human body or animals could provide, and then also some rudimentary ways of you know, using wind, uh, but in the old ways and so on. What happened with all this energy being available uh, is that we shifted to what we know in the 1900s as the um, Industrial Revolution that changed the way that people worked. So instead of having people actually running the process, people were actually controlling the machines. And you know the story since that time. The other thing that happened is that we managed to be able to change a lot the face of the earth. So take away a lot of forest, take away a lot of other types of, of, of land use and do massive food production. We used machines, but not only machines, we used a lot of fertilizers that are also very energy intensive. And the result was that we could produce much, much more food so that people were in a position, uh, actually we were in a position to feed many, many more people. And one more very important breakthrough through those hundred years that we described since the time of the industrial revolution is a development in science and especially health that managed to change the expectations and the expectancy for life um, for people not to, to lose their lives. And this is a picture of one of the first vaccinations from polio in, back in 1954, when uh, children were dying actually of polio. Since then, this has been eradicated, not eradicated, but it has been controlled as a problem. Uh, and we see, we have seen also what uh, progress means by the way that humanity had to deal with uh, the recent uh, outbreak of the COVID. Um, all of this progress has not come without increasing challenges as well. And so one of the challenges that we have is the change in world population. Look at this. This is a, a graph that shows how human population started to count from the 1700s. Actually, at that point, which is very close to the Industrial Revolution, 1920 or so, actually jumps. This is, this is the graph of how human population is increasing. We see that it's uh, reaching a top in the 1960s or something, and then the rate of increase starts going down, but the actual population keeps on, on increasing because the rate is positive, it's not negative. And so we have more population that is happening, that is coming on the earth. Um, and this is not distributed equally. This is a very interesting map that shows how many new lives we have every hour in different parts of the world. What is interesting to see is that we have, for example, in Kinshasa and in Lagos, in Nigeria, uh, 85 new lives. This is how many are born minus how many die in an average, right? Um, in Mumbai, in uh, India, we have plus 51. The only place where we have a negative number is Tokyo, minus one. Uh, but we see also that the dispersion and the distribution of the growth of population is really not equal around the world. 
And another inequality is food. We see that there are parts of the world, like some parts in Africa mostly, um, but also some parts in, uh, in Central uh, and in, in Asia that still have lots of problems with securing at least one meal per day. And the same thing happens with health, uh, with the burden of disease, where again, Africa is the biggest uh, issue, but we also have uh, some issues in, in Asia. Um, and this is without taking into account in this map, uh, because it's 2017, without taking into account the COVID effects. One more very important issue is uh, everything that is related to gender, and specifically this graph shows how important education for women, young women and girls, is important in terms of uh, population control in Africa. What you see here is that the current situation in 2015 was that Africa had 1.2 billion people out of the 7.3 in the total population. If we have a rapid development in education for young girls, for women, and uh, yeah, for young girls and women in Africa, this means that the uh, population will be contained 1.9 billion and the world population to 8.9. We will continue with uh, the status quo, which is that we have some efforts, but not very good uh, and not very efficient everywhere. That means that the Africa population will grow to 2.5 billion and the world population to 9.6. And if the system crashes and we don't have education development in Africa, this means that this population will increase to 3.2 and 11 billion globally. So you see that actually making uh, the, the necessary space and giving the right tools to women, to young women and to girls is very, very important, not only in terms of human development, but also in controlling population. This is also a very interesting graph that shows how the resource use is happening in the world. What you have here is a line that shows which is the world bio capacity. So what actually can be carried by the carrying capacity of the earth. And we see that we have a lot of countries that are still under the very high human development level. This is the human development index here. So many countries that are lagging in development are still uh, utilizing resources underneath the world biocapacity. But then you have countries that are either in the process of uh, development, like China, Brazil, and so on, that are above this. And of course, all the countries that you see here, like USA, Japan, all the red ones are European Union countries, are way outside. I mean, they have a high development level, but they're consuming too many resources. In a proper world, in a sustainable world, everybody should be inside this green box. And this is a failure of the system, obviously. Um, and the two biggest issues that we're facing is climate change. This map does not show you the effects only of climate change, but it's a, a, a map of displacements because of conflict and disasters in 2020. And it is the first time in the history of the world that we have more displacements in terms of numbers that are due to natural, resort, to natural causes uh, related to climate change, like floods, fires, and so on than displacements that are related to conflict, that are the, the, the red dots. This is a very important <clears throat> moment in history because it's for the first time that we see that nature becomes uh, a bigger issue for people not to be able to live in the places where they want to be, uh, rather than conflict and, and uh, wars. And the other very big challenge that humanity is facing and the planet is facing is the loss of biodiversity. Look again here how everything is rather contained until around the 1900s, remember the Industrial Revolution, and then the loss of species becomes really, really much, much higher after we start doing all this development. Obviously, this is very much related also to the effect that we said for changing the uh, use of land uh, for agriculture and so on. Um, all of these things, they create something that is uh, known in the discussions about sustainability as megatrends. Megatrends are powerful transformative forces that could change the global economy, our business and the society the way that we know it. And don't stick with the blue letters, just take the, the black ones. Uh, the megatrends that we have isolated and everybody speaks about is first urban growth because people are moving more and more into cities. Um, and uh, this means a lot of different demands for resources, for space, for construction materials, and so on. Second is girls' education. We just spoke about that. Wealth inequality. Uh, it's interesting to see that wealth inequality is actually increasing around the world. Food security. We mentioned the issues about food and uh, people not being able to secure at least one meal per day in many parts of the world. 
Burden of disease. I don't need to say more about it because you know uh, the, everybody knows now the case after COVID. But of course, it's not only this. Let me just tell you that I was speaking with a friend who's working with UNDP in uh, South Sudan, and I asked her during the times of COVID how things are with COVID, and she said, "Spiro, uh, things here are so critical that people don't even think about COVID. They have much bigger problems to 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 deal with." So you can imagine. Climate change that we mentioned before, biodiversity loss, and of course the pandemic. But of course, in terms of the mega trends, it's not only negative things. We have some positive things that are happening. So extreme poverty has fallen. The decline in the share of the world population that live in less with less than $1.9 a day has dropped from nearly 35% to under 11% in 2013. Um, the pandemic actually and uh, the war in Ukraine have actually reversed a little bit this process. Hunger is falling, and again, the hunger percentage is falling, but the actual uh, absolute number is increasing because the population is increasing. Child labor is on the decline, uh, which is a very important thing. Life expectancy is raising, rising. Sorry, More people are going to school and for longer time, so the schooling period for people is higher. Renewable energy is getting cheaper and widespread. Breakthroughs in medicine are very important, and we expect that we'll be able to control within the next 10 years, uh, not only pandemics, but also issues of, uh, of um, uh, diseases like heart disease, arteriosclerosis, cirrhosis, and so on. And of course, the technological progress uh, with the advent of uh, artificial intelligence, which of course uh, also hides some uh, risks, but we cannot get into the discussion right now. Uh, the response that people have decided that the countries have decided to have in the face of all of these uh, challenges is what we all know, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, as uh, some of you will know and others won't, uh, this is a decision that was made in 2015 by all of the countries of the United Nations where they agreed on the Agenda 2030 and they agreed on having those 17 Sustainable Development Goals that were dealing with the biggest challenges, poverty, hunger, health, education, so on and so forth, with specific sub-targets for each one of them. And the point was that those targets had to be met by 2030. Um, spoiler, we're not getting there. Uh, we are having some, some improvement, but because of uh, the pandemic, because of slow progress, and because also of uh, the armed conflict in Ukraine, but also in other places of the world, uh, the progress is stalling, is not going as fast as we, we want it to. So there's, need, there's a need to be more. Out of these things, one of the most famous, I would say, uh, agreements that came out of the Agenda 2030 is the Paris Climate Agreement, the effort to contain the global uh, temperature growth uh, under 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, yesterday, I was seeing the news that, in fact, uh, the news are not great there either because we're expecting that the permanent uh, ice cap in the North Pole would not disappear before 2040. Now it seems that scientists have uh, uh, verified that it will disappear before 2030, actually 10 years uh, earlier than we expected. And there are many other uh, issues that come with this. But it is not the only uh, global agreement that has to do. Look at this map. This is a map since 1971 for all the different agreements that have been agreed by different by the countries around the world in the context of the United Nations. Uh, so we have the UN Convention on Climate Change, but we also have Convention for Desertification and so on. So it's a continued process. Some of them are more known, some are less known, but it all means that there are a lot of activities and a lot of engagements for countries. And in order to make those engagements happen, we need funding. And the funding that needs to be mobilized to really make the Sustainable Development Goals happen is between 3.3 .3 to 4.5 trillion per year, which is a lot of money. And this is why what the United Nations say is that we need to shift finance towards the goals. And I'm saying this because we need to talk about finance in this uh, short, short presentation. So, as you will see, everyone from institutional investors to retail investors to investment funds to multi, uh, multilateral development banks and everything need to streamline their effort and lead it towards the sustainable development goals. And even if they do, or actually the reason why they do is that out of the 3.9 trillion that is used annually, uh, that is necessary annually uh, to reach the targets, 1.4 comes from the countries. 
but the rest, two and a half, needs to come from the private sector for investment entities and so on. And this is the investment gap, but it's also an opportunity why we need to invest more in things that are related to sustainability. Um, different parts of the world have developed uh, systems for providing for this. Uh, most of you will probably know the just transition mechanism of the European Union that is mobilizing in total uh, between 90 to 110 billion in investments for the Just Transition Fund for the energy transition. And we have many other examples. But let me tell you about specifically the role of business and why sustainable finance and investment is important. Uh, sorry, Christina, if I'm going too slow or I'm taking too much time, you'll just interrupt me, right? We do have time. Uh, no okay. worries, we do have time. Okay, thank you. So the role of business is, uh, in my view, very well uh, captured in what we call creating shared value. What is the point of creating shared value or CSV as it is known is the practice of creating economic revenue that also creates value for society by addressing its needs and challenges. So this can be done by reconceiving products and markets, redefining productivity in the value chain, local cluster development and so on. And in practice, what it means is that a company that has uh, corporate assets, uh, assets and expertise needs to see which are the business opportunities, which is what companies do in order to create profit, but also need to take into account how what they do can provide the solution to social needs. Social needs meaning from climate change to biodiversity loss to unemployment to hunger to everything. When a company is actually meeting those three uh, objectives through its core business, then it's creating shared value. And this is why we say that shared value is not corporate social responsibility or philanthropy, because creating shared value is at the core of the business strategy. And if you like, this is why we're also saying that uh, when a, a company is focusing on creating shared value, then it is already entering into what we measure through ESG, because corporate social responsibility can be something that is good, but not related to the core business. So, for example, a company that is producing, I don't know, metal chairs might be uh, planting a forest once every year or cleaning up a beach. But if it does not try to do something good from its own core business, which is producing metal furniture, then it's actually doing only marginal efforts through uh, what it does. Henry Ford, 100 plus years ago, was saying that a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business. I like this phrase very much because it actually condenses everything that sustainable business is about. Uh, if it is only about making money, then uh, we do not provide for society. We do not make sure that we meet what we're saying in the previous transparency, the social needs. And so uh, a company that is doing only this is by and large condemned to fail over at least the midterm. And this is why we have seen a number of companies that have actually done a lot of efforts in the past 10, 20 years to do this. And we see more and more that now shift towards sustainable business, sustainable investment, and so on. Let me show you this graph that comes from the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, um, that actually shows which is the spectrum of business in terms of doing good for society. So you have on the one end, traditional philanthropy, which is companies that actually invest their money without making any effort to have any returns from that. They just want to do good. Uh, and there are examples like this. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have fully commercial companies and investors that are limited or have no regard to environmental, social, or governance practices. Obviously, you have everything in between, venture philanthropy, social investing, impact investment, and then sustainable and responsible investing. What I was saying before about corporate social responsibility is what actually covers those two. Traditional philanthropy, some part of venture philanthropy, but uh, what we measure through ESG, and I will explain this in a minute, is everything that happens in here. And as you see, the two meet in a very, very small part. So it's very important that we do realize, and actually I see through the work that we do in our institute and with Very Impact, that now companies more and more start to realize this, that um, everybody starts to understand that CSR is not ESG or vice versa. Uh, in terms of how this was developed in time, back in the 80s, companies would look into environment, health and safety, the EHS, and they were reporting on this. In the 90s, they moved to full sustainability, which came, of course, with the advent also of the definition of sustainability. Then in 2000, 2010s, we had CSR, and now we're in the period of environmental, social, governance, or ESG. 
Let's see how ESG investment is happening. The global rise of ESG dedicated funds, so the funds that are looking into this part of the graph, how we can actually make money by actually investing in things that provide solutions. So look at this, these numbers here. The funds that started uh, providing investments, providing fund uh, funds in uh, investments that were covered by some types of ESG assessment, where in 2014, just over 10 uh, trillion assets under management. In 2022, this has uh, become five times as high and the uh, expectation for the bullish uh, growth is even bigger. And by 2024, we expect that we'll probably go beyond the 55 to 60 trillion assets under uh, dollars, assets under management. And the other interesting part of a graph like this, these are both from Bloomberg, is that uh, you can see here that the blue one is specifically about green investments or green debt. The yellow one is about social aspects. And this magenta one is about sustainability as a whole. It's very interesting to see that what is expected to be the full sustainability ESG investment is bigger than what was the base back in 2021, just in four years. So the growth is amazing, uh, and everybody is starting to look also to not only the environmental aspects of sustainability, but also to social and to other aspects as well. I'll go a little bit fast with this uh, because I wanted to, st to stay for a minute here. This is a survey that was done in 2021-2022 by the World Economic Forum. And they asked, uh, I don't remember how many people, which are the 10 biggest challenges that they see in terms of risks on a global scale in relation also to where investments should go. And the uh, listing that they did was the first climate action failure, extreme weather, very much connected between them, biodiversity loss, remember what we said about this huge loss of biodiversity that we have, social cohesion erosion uh, with things that we see happen in many parts of the world, livelihood crisis, infectious diseases, human environmental damage, natural resource crisis, debt crisis, and geoeconomic confrontation. If somebody had asked people like, I don't know, 50 or 60 years ago, just after the Second World War, for example, this one would have been at the top. And now it is the 10th because we have the other challenges at a very higher point. And this is what uh, people want to see and also investors want to see. Uh, also, uh, it's not only people and investors, it is also the policymakers. You will see uh, in those examples, for, for uh, instance, that there is a lot of guidance that is provided by different institutions, national, international, this is the OECD, uh, the World Bank, and so on, that provide guidance on how investment and engagement of investors can happen under the ESG principles. And uh, in Europe specifically, we have one case that is very, very important. Uh, Europe has adopted a regulation that is called the CSRD. CSRD is the, um, the, the, the uh, directive that explains how reporting should be done to measure ESG. And of course, it, it is based on the European taxonomy, which is a system that classifies which parts of the economy can be marketed as sustainable investments. I don't go to much detail here because we won't have the time and I do not want to tire you to, with too much information. But the CSRD, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, is the new legislation that requires all large companies, and as you will see later on, smaller companies too, to have regular reports and have a common reporting framework to show how things happen. Before that, there was another um, directive, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, which is ask, actually was asking companies to report. At the time, it was requiring companies that had more than 500 employees or were listed in a stock exchange and banks and insurance. Now, with a new directive, all large companies with more than 250 employees and or 40 million turnover and or 20 million in assets and all listed companies will have to report by obligation. And uh, that means that we jump from around 11,000, 11,500 companies in all of Europe to more than 45,000 companies that will have to do this kind of reporting uh, with many other things that are, are uh, very much engaging, like additional obligations for what needs to be reported, like the reporting standards, because before we did not have any obligation for any specific reporting standard, whereas now the European Union 
is preparing, has prepared the European Sustainability Reporting Standards that are approved by the joint um, body between the European Commission and the industry, and so on and so forth. I will just go uh, very quickly to this timeline that says that in 2025, businesses will already be subject to the uh, to the new um, directive, and they will have to report on the financial year 2024, which means that they have to collect to start collecting um, data practically from now. Then in 2026, large undertake undertakings that were not currently under the previous directive will have to do. And then in 2027, we have small and medium enterprises that will actually have to become part of this. So it's a very, very high um, requirement, let's say. And in order to do that, companies will have to embody sustainability in what they do. So uh, this is uh, saying by William McDonough, who is an architect, and says sustainability takes forever, and that's the point. Um, and uh, what we, we we mean when we say that we need to look into sustainability is that uh, every company, for example, is measuring its financial um, performance and its financial risks and financial issues. But we need to start now measuring those that are non-financial, such as environment, social capital, human capital, business model, innovation, leadership, governance, and so on. And thus provide this information to stakeholders and to shareholders so that they can know what is happening. And this is exactly what the, the directive that I mentioned before is doing. In order to do that, we connect it to the sustainable development goals and of course to the reporting standards. And I will go very quickly here. We have the most famous and most used reporting standard, which is GRI. Uh, it's the Global Standards for Sustainability Reporting, Global Reporting Initiative, means GRI. Um, and they provide a full set of standards that can give a universal view of what a company does. Sectoral standards, so if you have a company that is doing mining or a company that is doing tourism, you have to be able to measure properly what each one is doing. And then topic standards related, for example, to water, to energy, to society, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are some examples of the uh, questions that and the, the, the themes that are uh, reviewed in an ESG report by a company. Uh, the other very known and very applied standard is the SASB, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Uh, this one has a different approach. It uses GRI as its basis, but it has actually created all of these different subcategories so that each sub category, for example, construction materials or health healthcare distributors or leisure facilities, know exactly which is the reporting format and how they need to do it. Uh, big companies that have the means to do that use both uh, GRI and SASB. And there's, there's a final one, which is the TCFD. I mean, there's hundreds of different reporting standards, but here I have singled out three uh, for your that are the most used. TCFD is the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, and this is specifically about the impact of what companies do in terms of climate change and how they do it. Uh, banks are, by definition now, obliged to report according to TCFD because they, most of them have become signatories of the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. Investors do the same. They have to align with TCFD, and they report according to that. And of course, in each country and in each region, we have other things. Uh, in Greece, for example, we have the, the index that was developed by the Athens uh, Exchange, uh, the uh, Stock Exchange, and so on. Um, once somebody has done all the work for collecting the information and publishing their, their ESG report, the other very important step is analytics. Here we see an example of how scorecards are provided, for example, by Ecovadis, which is one of the most known companies doing these types of analytics. And they give analytics on how well a company is doing in terms of environment, ethics, labor and human rights, sustainable procurement, and so on and so forth. Here's another example of the methodology that Ver Impact has developed that shows not only how a company is doing in terms of full rating, environmental, social, and governance, but also how it is dealing with each one of the sustainable development goals. And this is very important because this allows decision makers not only to show what they're doing, but to also take corrective action. Um, when reporting in ESG, it is very important to consider some things like process automation, reporting that needs to emerge from a single point of convergence so that there is accountability, to secure the data that is transmitted because this is very sensitive data for a company, and of course to be able to process 
uh, and give feedback on what is reported. Uh, besides the, uh, the analytics, there is also a service that is provided by a number of companies, which is the ratings. Uh, this is Sustainalytics, another company that is doing a lot of work on ESG. This is the ESG risk ratings that they are doing. So you can see, for example, this company, these are uh, fictional companies, one plus one AG that has medium ESG risk. You have companies that have low risk, companies that have high risk and so on. This is very important for investors because when your company will want to go to an investor to uh, to look for, for um, investment for its development, your investor, the investor that you're addressing, will look into those things, maybe through uh, existing uh, ratings or by using their own tools that they will do. And I'm sure that we'll hear in the uh, next uh, from the next speakers about this. There is also the MSCI ESG rating. This is the um, Morgan Stanley tool that is developed, and it uh, actually provides different ratings, leader, average, laggard, and so on. And Christina, before you cut me off, I will things. be cutting you off yes. very, very soon because we will be doing the mechanics of um, yeah. sustainable finance with uh, Dr. Haris Labropi. Just this thing uh, about risk uh, management. Uh, when we manage to, when we do collect the information that I mentioned before, we are in a position to also assess the risks that we have in terms of different things: environmental performance, social responsibility, and so on. And this is a decision-making tool again for for companies and managers. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say is, I'll just go to the last slide, business transformation, which takes involving stakeholders, business culture. And so if a company wants to really go into the ESG uh, direction, they need to develop their own strategy, the capabilities and the structure, which is their internal governance, but also change the company culture because ESG and sustainability needs to permeate through the DNA of the entire company. It's not enough to have only the board. It's not enough to have only the ESG and sustainability people. Everyone needs to be involved in this process. And this is why we, at least in, in our institute, the Institute for Sustainable Development and also Very Impact, believe very much in the process of training. And with this, Christina, I think I will stop here. Uh, if there okay. are any questions, I'll be very happy to take them. And thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much. We have one question about um, the percentage of VC funds that are actually asking for ESG-driven startups. But um, I would like to, um, to, have, to take this question after uh, Ms. Farmaki. So with no further ado, and if Mr. Um, Haris Labropoulos also has sharing rights, I don't know if uh, this is, if we do have sharing rights for all our uh, panelists. I think um, everyone has sharing rights. Okay, so uh, Dr. Hari Labropoulos, uh, the floor is yours. You will be talking about the um, mechanics of sustainable finance, and you will also be bringing the perspective uh, of the banking sector as the president of the Hellenic um, a development bank of investments um am i still sharing my presentation yes you're sharing so you have stop to sharing. stop yeah. that so and now Harris can share. Uh, Harris okay. has the floor yeah. now sorry for that excellent thank you so much uh, uh, what one can say after this very thorough and elaborate presentation by spiros my dear friend spiros dear christina uh, that was uh a, a very thorough and very comprehensive uh, presentation on uh, sustainability, sustainable development. And uh, it was pretty clear uh, where we are heading to um, because it is uh, uh, perfectly understood by everybody now that um, um, the choices that you make, they have to abide with uh, certain uh, sustainability uh, criteria and uh, just to use also my professorial capacity uh, to say that uh, back in 2018 uh, the Nobel Prize was shared by two distinct uh, uh, professors of economics. One was Paul Romer for the endogenous growth theory uh, highlighting the role of innovation in uh, promoting uh, uh, growth uh, and especially sustainable growth for the betterness of uh, 
the societies. And uh, the other one was to William Nordhaus, where he explained uh, he was, of course, restricted uh, to one part of what Spiros uh, discussed uh, 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 earlier. Uh, he was restricted to the climate change, um, the uh, role of economic growth in damaging the, the climate, and the role of the new investment uh, model in investing in the new uh, day, in the new era. So <clears throat> that, was, that was very uh, uh, helpful. So I will share my presentation. Thank you very much. So what I will uh, try to cover now is... Uh, the part that uh, Spiros explained earlier. Um, and I, I will focus, of course, um, on uh, not on the general banking, let's say, um, outset, but uh, on uh, the private equity and venture capital uh, uh, scheme. So uh, from my part, as the president of the Hellenic Development Bank of Investments, I would like to explain how venture capital uh, take into ESG into account and what is uh, uh, the case in Greece and uh, our role in promoting this. So to start with, just explain to our audience uh, what is uh, HDBI. HDBI uh, is not a bank, is the sovereign fund of funds of uh, Greece. And our main activity is to manage uh, state and EU funds and uh, to procure these uh, uh, resources along with other investors, this is a key uh, uh, point uh, in new venture capital and private equity private equity funds, mainly on a pari passu basis on equal terms, meaning and uh, money in approach, meaning by share capital increase for growth capital in a company, and not to buy out other shareholders, for example. Uh, so the, this is a new. Uh, a new uh, corporate structure. However, the previous uh, uh, statue of uh, HDBI was known as uh, TANEO, uh, New Economy Development Fund, uh, back in 2000, which uh, kick, helped to kickstart the venture capital uh, market in Greece. And then we had uh, other initiatives like uh, from the uh, European uh, um, uh, Union uh, side, like uh, the Jeremy uh, Initiative and the, the Equi Fund. So today, what we do is that we try to steadily work towards the enlargement of uh, the equity ecosystem uh, in Greece. Uh, we try to foster international best uh, market practices and uh, establish uh, sound international strategic uh, partnerships. Uh, today, uh, we uh, manage about 2.1 billion uh, euro that were mandated by the Greek state uh, uh, for us to invest in this uh, new venture capital and private equity funds. Uh, we do that through um, the eight innovative uh, open calls. We follow the demand versus supply approach, meaning that uh, we want to abide with uh, the market appetite and not to create an artificial uh, uh, demand uh, in the market. We um, <clears throat> apply, we refer to various uh, asset classes and multiple sectors. We uh, aim to support innovation and the entrepreneurial landscape. And of course, at the end of the day, we want to produce positive impact in the Greek economy. In this uh, respect, I would also like to add that we act as the equity platform instrument of uh, the National Resilience and Recovery Plan, uh, Greece 2.0, of uh, the RRF, the European Commission Resilience and Recovery Facility. We manage 500 million euro there. And of course, we manage on behalf of the state 93 uh, million euros uh, invested in the Festos uh, uh, fund for uh, 5G technologies. So the epicenter of our strategy, as I said, is to further develop 
and strengthen the Greek venture capital ecosystem. And our mottos, which are reflecting our core vision and embedded values, are we invest for growth and financing innovation. However, uh, it's not only what we do from uh, the Greek part. Uh, we look at the broader picture. We want to multiply the effect. And therefore, we need to have, as I said earlier, credible and successful strategic and investment alliances and partnerships, um, either sovereign or private at the European level, and of course, further afield. Uh, this is very critical in today's uh, global environment. We want to put the Greek entrepreneurship uh, in the radar of uh, foreign investors. We want to attract value-added investments. And of course, we want to help our fund managers to facilitate successful exits. So in that respect, we have uh, solid partnerships with uh, BPI France, the French uh, uh, development banking and investment institutions. Uh, we have partnered as a founding member with uh, four other, uh, with three other uh, European uh, counterparts apart from BPI France, the German KFW Capital, uh, TESI from Finland and Fexfonden from uh, Denmark to, to create a partnership for uh, the so-called Scale Up Europe uh, initiative, where uh, what is uh, about is about growth funds co cooperation. <laughs> Sorry, I, I have a cold as well. That's why I, I, I apologize for that. Uh, to invest in big tech uh, that is uh, scale, scaling up in Europe before they decide to depart from the European uh, landscape and the European uh, value added and GDP contribution to go abroad, like, uh, for example, overseas in uh, the States or in uh, Asia. This is uh, very important. And we have uh, close partnerships with the European Investment Fund, our uh, European counterpart, where we work together uh, in uh, developing new initiatives like, for example, uh, uh, initiatives in uh, the sector of uh, biosciences, which is very important for our continent. Uh, on top of that, uh, on the international uh, setup, we have uh, signed agreements with Mubadala Capital and ADQ uh, Abu Dhabi Developmental Holding uh, for co-investing and facilitating and supporting investing in our country 4.4 uh, billion uh, uh, euros. These are contracted already and uh, we work um, uh, systematically on that uh, end. The investment activity has uh, already started. And of course, we discuss with our counterparts from uh, the <clears throat> Gulf region and the uh, Saudi Arabian Peninsula like <coughs> Mumtalakat from Bahrain and uh, PIF, the Public Investment Fund of uh, Saudi Arabia. So our vision is for HDBI to be the credible equity sovereign partner of Greece to facilitate successful investments and act as an ambassador and further catalyst to support the Greek venture capital and private equity ecosystem, bringing the SMEs and startups in the epicenter. This is, uh, of course, in order to accelerate sustainable growth by paying attention to the market needs, by fully incorporating international best practices, as I also mentioned earlier, and mobilizing financial and other resources. But most importantly, by abiding with ESG criteria and the newly introduced by the Resilience Recovery uh, Fund uh, facility, the DNSH principles do no significant harm, which is a further, uh, let's say, step uh, beyond uh, ESG. And this is uh, contracted uh, to the mandates that we have from uh, managing these uh, European resources. This is very important because in the uh, mandates that we had before the RRF, uh, the ESG uh, principles were 
imposed or were introduced rather by ourselves. However, now DNSH is an integral part of procuring these uh, resources. Of course, the target is to have social and environmental impact and to serve the sustainability strategy towards uh, and through sustainable financing, abiding and complying with sustainable development goals, the UN 17 sustainable goals that Spiros explained earlier. Our central ESG philosophy is that the ESG criteria are not a panacea or an unnecessary bureaucracy. Many people, I think that this is becoming uh, quite understood right now. A uh, few months ago, last year, for example, or a couple of years ago, many people were looking at it as an unnecessary bureaucracy. However, what we say, and we discuss with our fund managers, is that to the contrary, this is a competitive uh, advantage. The, it has not be a distinct part of the organization's uh, strategy, but it has to be a, a fundamental component of uh, the DNA of an organization. And uh, it has to emerge in all its activities, either internal or, ex or external. And what we like to say is that this has to be the character and not the appearance. Uh, it is the ESG criteria are always at the core of our uh, evaluation process. And uh, especially we pay a lot of attention on the corporate governance. So on the G, of course, uh, however, the E uh, and uh, the S is uh, the, the environmental and the social is very important. However, for uh, a company to be uh, fundable, investable, and to be able to scale up needs strong governance. Uh, so the, 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 the ultimate fact is that uh, by making investments that you are proud of um, <clears throat> and have, uh, there have to have a positive social and environmental footprint and you have to connect with them and identify if uh, I may say so with uh, uh, with uh, these investments. So this is very important uh, in the process. So by, uh, if I may also add after what Spiros uh, thoroughly uh, explained, uh, the international experience has uh, shown that uh, organization and companies that they foster ESG criteria uh, are in general more resilient they attract more talent more effectively and ultimately they offer better returns to shareholders and investors. The second bullet point, the attraction of more talent is very important uh, nowadays because we uh, understand that we, uh, in today's uh, uh, era, the, uh, the, the talent plays a key role in uh, the success of an organization and the young people, they are more aware of uh, the environmental, social, and uh, governance uh, uh, rules, and regulations, and uh, criteria. So they also try to find from their side um, uh, what is uh, the best fit uh, for them. So that's why these criteria, they have become particularly important. They are the focus of uh, eligible uh, financing across the spectrum <coughs> sorry of uh, banking and the financial activity so from our side uh, we try to see what we can do as an organization so we set first the example of integrating and developing the exg esg criteria in our organization as a sovereign fund of funds of greece in three main axes on the corporate level, uh, which is in the very operation of our organization, uh, in our corporate governance systems, uh, uh, operations and uh, participation of uh, uh, women in management, uh, but also in uh, employees. We are proud to say 
that uh, we have a very uh, diverse and uh, gender uh, friendly uh, environment here uh, where on our board we have 40% uh, uh, female representation and uh, about 70% in our uh, operations. Um, the, the second uh, AX uh, uh, axis is uh, on the uh, fund management, uh, uh, the general partners, as we say, the GPs uh, level um, in which uh, we invest, uh, where we uh, expect to see uh, as a key element of uh, our evaluation process the existence of uh, an ESG policy in the proposals that uh, we receive, the intention and the procedures for integrating the ESG criteria uh, at both uh, the general partners level and the fund uh, operation. Um, we expect our fund management teams to have uh, an SG, ESG compliance uh, officer, but uh, <clears throat> also to have ESG criteria uh, being as an integral, integral part of uh, their selection process for picking up uh, the investments uh, that uh, they made. And of course, uh, the third uh, axis uh, refers to the investee company level uh, where the funds are investing at um, and they form the so-called underlying investments of uh, the funds. So uh, the, in this uh, uh, respect, we expect um, that the fund manager should ensure that the companies in which they invest, they comply with uh, the ESG criteria and the do no significant harm uh, principles were applicable. And uh, in addition uh, to the required uh, annual financial reporting, um, uh, audited uh, reporting, we want to have for the fund managers to have in place a mechanism for monitoring and reporting non-financial information at all levels um, to be also provided uh, to us. Uh, okay, we all understand and we see that a lot of progress uh, has been made. This is not uh, something that uh, like uh, international fi financial reporting standards, uh, uh, one can uh, copy and uh, apply. There are uh, various uh, uh, aspects uh, for somebody to consider. However, this is very important. And uh, I think, and Spiros, uh, Mr. Spiros Kuvelis can, uh, explain more uh, on the efforts uh, and the progress achieved so far towards uh, ESG reporting uh, to date. Um, okay, what I want also to say is that in, uh, in traditional banking, in commercial banking, um, uh, what is uh, very important and what will become very important is that uh, ESG at uh, a certain point of time will become uh, definitely an on-off uh, criterion for granting or non-granting uh, financing to uh, a company. Um, but uh, what is uh, we see that is happening now is uh, that ESG compliance or ESG um, friendly uh, companies, they have accessib accessibility to a wider range of products and environmental um, um, uh, in, in the traditional banking sector. So, uh, so moreover, apart from the investor side being either sovereign as uh, ourselves or our, our uh, international counterparts or financial intermediaries like the fund managers or otherwise, special emphasis on ESG compliance is also given by the supervisory authorities and regulators. For example, the Hellenic Capital Markets Commission, uh, it was uh, briefly uh, mentioned by Spiros earlier, has asked uh, large listed companies uh, in Greece to provide written non-financial information disclosures, meaning uh, and referring to ESG, 
that companies must make in accordance with Article 8 of the so-called taxonomy regulation, which was applied for the first time in Greece last year, in 2022. Very important. So this is uh, becoming part of uh, our <clears throat> normal uh, uh, entrepreneurial and uh, corporate uh, process. Coming back to the VC, to the venture capital funds, special emphasis, as I said, is placed on companies that they have a mission to make uh, the world uh, a better place, uh, that they share high values, and uh, that combine both prosperity together with uh, achieving their goal, meaning they bring profits to the shareholders. Um, additionally, um, uh, to uh, what would be uh, envisaged earlier as a single investment criteria, meaning the financial re results. So we see that uh, mainly on companies that they incorporate innovative uh, technology solutions, focusing on solving real problems with uh, high social and environmental uh, impact, um, is uh, in the are in the epicenter of the investment uh, uh, selection process of uh, the various uh, fund management investors, and indicatively, I can say about uh, clean energy, the so-called clean tech, uh, agri tech, food tech, fintech, prop tech, health tech, cyber security, uh, mobile uh, and skill certification. Uh, skilling, reskilling, and upskilling, industrial technology and context, and so on. So, just to to say that, uh, um, despite that, our innovative open calls, the eight open calls that uh, I um, explained earlier that we have in HDBI, uh, they were announced three and a half, uh, four four years uh, approximately ago. Uh, they abide to a large extent, to, to the above. So what we try to do is that we want to continually evolve the framework for the implementation of uh, age, ESG. Uh, as I said earlier, one cannot do alone things. Uh, therefore, we have partnered and uh, worked, uh, worked closely with uh, the European Investment Advisory Hub of the European Investment Bank to uh, update continuously um, the information on ESG, to uh, be aware of uh, the best practices from uh, other countries and peer organizations, adapt them to uh, a certain level and uh, when necessary to incorporate them to uh, our own procedures. And of course, we discuss with other organizations like, for example, uh, EPLO. We have uh, the pleasure to discuss together with uh, Spiros and uh, Christina, get, get, get uh, continuous feedback uh, on that and try to incorporate as much as possible this uh, new knowledge on our procedures. So, uh, closing my presentation, what uh, I would like to say is that uh, despite the various uh, global major disruptions and prolonged uncertainties that we are facing uh, nowadays. The prospects are quite positive. Uh, we saw that uh, from uh, uh, Spiro's uh, report on progressing on the international, of course, we saw the challenges, but also the progress. And uh, of course, I want to state that, uh, that sustainable finance plays a key and very important role to this end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Harila um, A very thorough presentation on what HDBI does and how sustainable finance and uh, ESG criteria and implementation of ESG criteria is part of what you do of the work work you do. I, I have been taking down notes like ESG criteria is not a panacea or uh, it's not an unnecessary bureaucracy and the fact that you're looking into the non-financial information and reporting uh, from, from companies. And uh, with no further ado, let's move on to Mrs. Uh, Teresa Farmaki from Astarte Capital and 
uh, we're all ears to hear um, about sustainable finance from the perspective of a fund, because we have many questions regarding to, um, to what investors are looking into, especially for early startups. And um, just a, a little bit of applause to the startups that participate in our Acceler Horizon funded acceleration program that uh, I see in the, in the attendee list. And I also see that they, they have a lot of questions. So, Ms. Hermaki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I can see the question, so hopefully I will be able to share my uh, perspective uh, in that. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Let me share um, my presentation here. Perfect. I hope you can see it fine, right? Okay. So uh, first of all, let me start by, for you who don't know who Astarte is and uh, explain, put in perspective basically where I'm coming from. Astarte, we are an asset manager. We're based in London and have offices in Athens as well, uh, in Toronto and Sydney. And our focus is exclusively on sustainable real assets. So infrastructure, energy transition, transportation, nature-based solutions and forestry that I will talk about. And uh, our approach into the space is really follow the macro trends that you heard very well already before. Follow the macro trends, identify assets and investment opportunities that play a clear role towards sustainability and invest our capital and help other investors invest next to us in order to scale and provide and complete that journey. So our perspective into this and what you will hear from me is really our view of working with private investors, primarily institutional investors globally, how, and how we can mobilize private capital to really help invest in these opportunities and assets that provide, that help us move towards net zero and provide a solution uh, towards sustainability. I will cover very briefly, because you've heard a lot about already on that, is what is the problem, but putting it a little bit into context. And then what are challenges and opportunities for private investors into coming into that space? And lastly, but not least, the example, a very strong and powerful example that we have found as a company to invest in the space, nature-based solutions or nature-based investments and forestry in specific. So first of all, about the problem, you heard about climate change, global warming, so I will not go into explaining what it is, but some very strong, again, data around it is that nine out of the 10 warmest years since 1880 have been in the last 15 years. Um, this is a very real problem. It's already affecting us. We all feel, even in Greece, right, that we felt maybe that it was a bit more remote. We feel the volatility and the extreme weather conditions. And this is droughts, wildfires. Maybe you've heard what's happening in Canada these days. The fires, the, the smoke from, from wildfires that have never happened before have reached all the way down to Miami. Uh, floods, tropical storms, and rising sea levels. Now, just to put in perspective, we talk about carbon credits and I will talk a lot about CO2. So do you all know what is a ton of carbon credit that we typically refer to? The easiest example is a balloon of diameter nine meters. So this is a very, very big quantity and we refer to it in millions usually. Now, the cost of climate change and why is it so important for private investors as well? Not just policy, not just nice to talk about because there is a very real and a very relevant financial impact as well that everybody feels from governments all the way to private investors. These numbers here show you just the financial losses as related to, uh, to, to weather disasters or um, climate change, directly climate change events. So just in 14 years from 1970 to 2010, the financial losses have risen from 50 million a day to about 400 million a day globally. And that can tell you the magnitude effectively of direct economic and resource loss that we are all experiencing. Um, again, this is another way of saying, of uh, looking at it, the budget that we originally had calculated uh, were allowed effectively to maintain the one and a half degree uh, increase in temperature, we have already exhausted 86% of that. And if we don't do anything drastic, we will reach the limit in about 10 years. Now, very broadly again, and you've seen that before, I'm sure, United States, China, Russia among the top three emitters, and you follow down the list. And in terms of, econo of uh, commodities or economic activity that mostly contributes to emissions, it's aluminium and other main commodities. Now, 
in terms of CO2 absorption or areas where you usually tend to capture the CO2 and therefore avoid that uh, the effect. This is the tree cover back in 2010. And here you see the tree cover loss again in the past 10, 20 years only. So you can see the massive effect that we have been doing on our planet from the trees. And again, leading into a little bit forests and, and the role of forests in mitigating that or changing that. So challenges and opportunities for private investors. You heard already that a big part of the problem, of the solution needs to come from private capital. So what is their perspective? How do they see and um, what are the, some of the main issues why they do invest and what keeps them from investing, correct? So number one is, as we like to say, it, climate change has become financially relevant. It's not a nice to doing, it's not a just social responsibility, it's not just responsibility. It has become financially relevant and it's a material part of every investment decision that people make. And therefore it has become an integral part of how private investors invest across everything, quite frankly, today. So a little bit, so back to the questions of how many investors care about ESG and, and climate change and, 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 su and sustainability, Reality is that from what from our perspective, everyone cares. The, the question is more how educated they are, how familiar they are, how many resources they have to evaluate it appropriately. Um, and obviously how much it is integrated into their processes. If it is financially relevant, if the numbers are huge, then why some investors are not, right? What is keeping them or why um, it, don't we see a, a faster or bigger, uh, bigger increase in, in private capital in that space? Number one is there is still a very big, um, I will call it misconception, quite frankly, of whether ESG and sustainable investing comes at a discount, right? Or is a compromise or a trade-off to financial return. Reality is today, you've heard it from other speakers, and I will say it again, we believe at the start, we strongly believe that ESG and sustainable investing is actually direct value creation. It's not, it's not a compliance matter. It's not a ethical matter. It's a direct also, in addition to everything else, it's a direct source of value creation. I will give you tangible examples. Organic, produ organic products, right? Organic uh, agricultural products, responsibly sourced materials into retail products, generally demand or command a premium. C customers are willing to pay more for responsibly or um, organic products. The second thing is, um, in, in the other way around, is from risk management perspective. If you capture properly your ESG analysis when you are uh, operating your companies, when you are transporting your goods, when you are building your houses, you minimize environmental um, pro problems and therefore you're less likely to face issues of um, lawsuits, if we call it on a directly legal or regulatory problem, or actual destruction or main increasing maintenance that you will need to spend more in the future effectively to bring it up to speed. So from both sides, either risk, risk management or direct value recognized in the market, from both sides, it is a value creation. The second thing, greenwashing. There's already, there was also a question about it in the audience and you often hear the term, right? Investors, the same thing. Like they, everybody agrees today that sustainable investing is extremely important, but what about greenwashing? Nobody wants to be caught uh, a victim of that. And therefore it's an increasing question. How, do, how can you know if people are really doing what they're saying they're doing, right? Or how can you really tell who is doing the right thing versus just putting a nice marketing facade? And all the tools and and, and bodies that Spiros mentioned in the beginning are tools and aim to help in that process. So there is a very big effort in um, trying to, um, to, to identify effectively or um, raise the awareness of uh, the right actions through reporting or through standards. And of course, it does come down to every, each one of us doing our due diligence, right? Uh, and looking and putting in maybe a little bit more work um, into what is actually there from the company side or the manager side. Uh, again, maybe pointing to some questions, what you can do uh, to avoid or not to be victim. The essence of it comes down to how do everything you can to show that everything you advertise as your principles and as your actions are somehow re re verifiable or demonst demonstrable through your results. 
So putting the processes, putting the tools, reports, data, keep track of things, everything you can do to demonstrate that what you talk is actually implemented through your processes is what makes is, is what avoids the pitfalls of, uh, of greenwashing. The next one though, at the same time, does is kind of the same thing is data availability. A big reason why private capital is not um, being mobilized faster effectively into sustainable finance is data availability. ESG um, uh, is relatively new as an area of focus and monitoring, therefore, and there are less data available. So companies are still this trying to, di to discover or implement effectively processes that can bring more data into what they're doing and how the things they're doing, how they have been um, generating results. And this is particularly true when it comes around social uh, impact effectively. Environmental, we now are becoming much better in measuring our CO2 footprint, um, material intensity, uh, but at the same time, if you think of things like social impact, how, how well do we engage with local communities? How, how well, um, what is the full impact of our actions of a project to the broader welfare of a community? This is where it becomes more difficult, right? Or people are now coming to find the ways to demonstrate these things. So data availability is a true, um, kind, let's say, restriction in, in the space. But at the same time, this is where I like to say, if you feel that, if you see something or a project or a company or a team that does something that looks like it's, it's the right thing, it's also up to us to put in the work to see whether they are, doing, what is happening there and whether the data is there. It's not just waiting to get the perfect data set, right? To make investment decisions. If we want to act and we are want to act today, we, it's also up to us to put in a little bit more work and a little bit more, more time into the, the exercise. Um, and the last thing, of course, is fear of novel, right? For sustainable finance, investment models, investment opportunities, business models. Uh, these are all relatively new. Um, a lot of institutions, a lot of teams, no matter how big, they're still getting up, to, up the learning curve of understanding how all of this plays out. And of course, there is a natural hesitation of jumping on the boat. And that makes sense, of course. Um, but then again, this is where now all this effort and hopefully this workshop as well, right? It, it's on, is help people get up to speed faster because there's definitely an urgency in all of us acting and, and private investors acting in that. Now, Turning to a start and, uh, as I said, an area that we have discovered to be extremely powerful as a solution uh, in that journey and a way, an area that we place a lot of focus of, uh, of our activities, nature-based solution so, and forestry. Forest. So first of all, what do we mean by nature-based solutions in case you're not familiar with the term? This is really investing in or managing natural ecosystems. So think of it, agriculture, forestry, land management, oceans. And today is the ocean day, for those of you not, uh, not aware, uh, in order to address societal changes, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and generally promote healthy ecosystems. Because this is the most, um, this is the, the, the best way, or the most effective way, really, of addressing everything we discussed previously, right? F uh, flooding, soil erosion, biodiversity loss, climate risks. Um, these solutions are generally recognized as the most effective way of combating these issues. And just to give you an idea, G20 economies need to double their investment in nature-based solutions by mid-century, this is 20 years later, right? In order to help prevent environmental crisis. So why forest specifically? Forest is a very big part of nature-based solutions and forest specifically because forests are one of the biggest today basins for absorbing or sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere while also providing huge benefits when it comes to biodiversity, natural ecosystem, and providing sustainable, bi sustainable biomass that is so much in need across so many industries across the world today in order to replace, right, to substitute plastics, oil-based products with more sustainable material. Um, and um, so I think the, the best metric on this page is really that Forests today absorb about 30% of CO2 released from fossil fuels, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the impact that forests have in our world today. Another way of seeing it is deforestation, which is one of the biggest problems therefore, right? 
of uh, equally the problem. If deforestation was um, carbon emission, it would be the third biggest emitting country after China and in the United States. So deforestation is massive around the world, as some of the previous pages show it. Now, when are forests most useful? Coming to how we apply our solution, therefore, and where we put our money to come to the point of it. Forests are most useful when they are fast, the young, fast growing trees, because that's when they produce most of the biomass and biomass through their natural um, photosynthesis is when they absorb the CO2 from the atmosphere. So areas where you can have fast growing young forests, that's where you have the biggest impact um, on CO2 and, uh, and greenhouse emissions. Today, um, forests absorb, as I mentioned, about 30% of uh, CO2 emissions, oceans is about another 23-25% and the rest goes in the atmosphere. If we were just to stop deforestation, not even grow forests, we would absorb another 25% of, uh, of that. The other reason though, why is forest so important, as I mentioned, is because few people realize how many products today can, are already or can't be produced by wood. Wood is natural fiber. And effectively, everything can, that can be made from oil can be made for wood. So today, we all know about all the companies setting targets for paper-based so paper products, replacing plastics. All of that traces back to, as a, to wood as a, as a raw material. Um, maybe you don't realize that Formula One tires include wood, effectively, or natural fiber, Tylenol, aspirin, right? That a lot of us take for, uh, for headaches and even clothes today are produced based on natural fiber. So natural fiber is actually the main product replacing all of these products material across the world for, and especially in construction. This page here shows that a four story building produced from concrete on average emits has about hundred tons of CO2 built out of wood timber frame. It has, it reduces 150. So you can see the, the magnitude, right? Uh, and therefore, and how this can help us move to an actually much more sustainable future. Um, in forests, and this is where sometimes there is another big discussion, but I will just touch on it. We believe that managed forests, therefore, have is where you can maximize the impact because forests are great anyway. Creating new forests, fast growing is, is, is good but in any case. But if you, if you have, if you find the opportunity, to develop managed forests where effectively you can in rotations constantly be harvesting to produce materials for the world that's where you maximize the impact because then you can feed all these other sectors with material that can replace um, others and this is all through nature right nature-based solutions um, this is now coming to again it's an investment it's private capital i mentioned about ESG impact and returns going hand in hand, in our opinion. This is how this works in forestry. The demand for wood, there is a huge, massive demand supply gap, and therefore generally wood is a very valuable commodity today. So there is a natural financial return coming from wood. And here it shows you the need for private capital and investment if we are to meet the, 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 the targets. Uh, for demand in the world across all sectors. In fact, and again, meeting those targets of replacing um, more um, intense or CO2 emitting material with sustainable uh, matter. The other source that maybe some of you are already familiar with is carbon credits. Carbon credits is a market that has helped a lot of private capital be mobilized in nature-based solutions. And I know that there's a lot of criticism around it as well, but reality is it has helped a lot of investment in this space as well. So this is a picture I like to finish with. Um, funny enough, we talk a lot about technology, we talk about venture capital, but forestry and trees, we like to call it, is the, mo the only established, the, the only proven technology today that can be implemented in scale to um, have such an impact in CO2 absorption and uh, move to a sustainable future. So with that, um, I can finish my uh, presentation and happy to take any questions if we have extra time or um, um, move to the next uh, speaker. Um, I can just, I guess, mention before I leave you with um, the specific, just to give you an idea of the magnitude because I made the thesis for forestry, but as a real case example, 
I started, we are investing in, we have, we are investing about 300 million US dollars in Latin America in new, in expansion of new growing sustainable forests. They are FCA certified, F FSC certified. This is the highest certification for sustainability. We, impl we monitor biodiversity. We are already observing the increase of biodiversity in the area with new with animals moving in the space and flora effectively as well being expanding um, we are on track to deliver to absorb 14 million tons of carbon credit which is equivalent to the entire country of paraguay of uh, annual emissions and we are planting about 150 football fields a day in new trees this is the magnitude that just us as a starter can do in, in this space. So hopefully um, can give you an idea of the power that private capital can and all of us can in that, in that journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Teresa. I mean, uh, again, uh, I have been taking notes about the cost of the climate change and what this means for investors, because sometimes we only get, you know, the, the numbers from uh, from uh, researchers and uh, scientists, scientific data and numbers, but not the real cost of the climate change crisis. Um, again, the greenwashing debate and uh, what uh, there was also a question uh, regarding green, not greenwashing, but what an early startup can do uh, in terms of establishing an ESG um, aligned uh, strategy. There's a lot that a, an early startup can do in the sense that um, because it is um, a very flexible structure, uh, you can actually implement the ESG criteria uh, more flexibly and more efficiently than a big corporation. Uh, a lot of debate, as I said, on greenwashing. There are also a lot of other terms that relate to greenwashing, green claims. There's a directive from the European Union, green hashing, when a company doesn't really promote what they do in terms of sustainability because uh, they're afraid that they might be accused of greenwashing. There's also green botching when you have the best uh, of intentions to be green, to be sustainable, to be ESG aligned, but because there's not um, great infrastructure or um, there hasn't been um, a consumer or um, a behavioral change in society, then you cannot really deliver what you promise. Uh, data availability, this is something that Spiros briefly mentioned. There's not enough ESG data um, uh, as regards reporting, as regards disclosures. So this is this is a problem when it comes to investors, when it comes to researchers, when it comes to ESG um, reporting companies like us. Uh, there's also um, a question uh, in the in the chat for for Teresa regarding the um, that the. Um, it's not a, a question, actually. It is a statement that the net forest cover is increasing despite the deforestation. And there's also a question about monoculture tree plantations. So um, is it a monoculture uh, tree plantation, what you do, or is it, um, uh, do you employ other species that are local to the uh, jurisdiction, to the geography that you um, actually um, work in? We have a combination. So. Uh, if we're talking about managed forests, to a great extent, they need to be monoculture because that's what industry needs in order to produce construction material or actually paper pulp in order to meet for all of these companies to meet their paper targets. So you, as a world moving to sustain a bit to sustainable future, you cannot avoid monocultures. The point we make and how we do it is that we employ uh, practices that protect and enforce biodiversity uh, in, order, in, the, in that process. Because so for in, as, I, as I mentioned in our case, for example, we have a voluntary target of 25% of the land that we buy, we do not plant on it. We set it aside and we help local conservation, local species of um, have a natural regrowth, right? And, and local uh, species to observe. We keep corridors between plots of trees in order to allow species of animals to move around, correct? So there are ways um, to do it, even with monocultures, um, that do not have the negative effects that very well, whoever asked that question knows that in many cases are observed. Just to give you an idea that we have, as a, one of our investors is the pension fund of an of a international, very large environmental agency. And they invited us as a case study of how you can do it right to present at COP26 within the Biodiversity Summit. So I can definitely say that 
while this is a very big area of monitoring and, or, and focus, it can be done. Great, thank you. There's also another question about the oceans because today is the World Ocean Day. Um, we will not uh, be focusing on uh, sustainable blue finance in this um, in this webinar. Um, if you if you go back to our uh, LinkedIn page at Very Impact at, at the Institute for Sustainable Development, we have a lot of webinars and a lot of discussions that we have uh, hosted uh, on the subject uh, because it's such a huge issue. Uh, we we really need a new webinar to talk about that. But of course, there are a lot of um, a lot of investments being made in the blue economy. Seagrass being one of them. Spiros can also um, think of uh, a couple of uh, investments that are being made in the blue economy sector in the in the ocean that um, are more nature based in their um, in their nature. And with uh, no further ado, we go to um, Mr. Nicolas Caribis. He's the program manager of the People's Trust, a charity organization, uh, social entrepreneurship one based in Athens. Uh, Nicola, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you for your invitation. Let me also share my screen. I don't know if you're seeing a full screen. Not yet. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, this is great. Thank you. So again, thank you for your invitation. Uh, we've already had great presentations, views, considerations, and, and I feel should perfectly my opening with, with with a question, can entrepreneurs save the world? And that was in fact a spotlight question in Harvard Business Review, featuring the article of Ashoka's Bill Braden and Valeria Budenik. And the article read that many people today have the sense that as change accelerates, the world's problems are multiplying faster than solutions. Slums are growing daily, affordable and sustainable energy is elusive. We are failing to provide adequate, uh, adequate health care for many citizens. And wh whatever the issue may be, we believe that the most powerful and profitable answer is often a new form of partnerships between business and the citizen sector, which is now composed of millions of competent and competitive organizations, often led by entrepreneurs. I also personally believe that entrepreneur-led organizations can be a considerable part of powerful and profitable organization. Honestly, what worries me though is that despite how current the topic is, I am referring to a 13-year-old publication dated 2010. Consequently, I cannot help but wonder if we are on a converging or diverging path if we're getting there or if we're staying far from it. So let me introduce our organization. Uh, the People's Trust is a privately funded nonprofit organization aimed at tackling unemployment in Greece through supporting entrepreneurship, providing microfinancing, primarily grants and supplementary non-interest loans. Hence, we're constantly trying to identify entrepreneurs within our mandate, and we are evaluating business plans, looking for long-term viability and new job creation potential. Since 2016, our organization, which is founded and solely funded by the Athanasios Laskaridis Charitable Foundation, has supported more than 550 businesses, creating more than 1,300 new job positions and with a survival rate of more than 90%, of which we are very proud of. We constantly support these businesses by offering business development services as training, networking, and mentoring. And our aim is funding being only the beginning of our relationship with our beneficiaries. And let me clarify that we do not hold any stake in the companies we fund, not we are involved in, in the management in, in any way. So now discussing sustainable finance and seconding 
the excellent earlier argumentations on the uh, ESG considerations that we as well value highly and we aim at. Uh, I wish to add and briefly discuss the notion that just providing seed finance in some cases is not enough. Specifically, as we operate in the non-profit space, we need to ensure that if possible, all our seeds succeed, all our seeds flourish. That is, all the companies we fund remain viable and keep creating new job positions. In that sense, for us, offering business development services or business development support is paramount. Uh, so how we do it? We, we ensure quality training by esteemed educational and consulting organizations, which are tailored to the needs and the profiles of our beneficiaries. Uh, we are having a diverse network of mentors that we try to keep active. Uh, and of course, we try to enforce networking among the people trust beneficiaries, while, while we always look for opportunities to introduce and promote them. So working, studying, discussing social entrepreneurship, one immediately becomes acquainted with organizations as Asoka, the School Foundation, the Swab Foundation, Unu Social Business, and fortunately many more, becomes acquainted with entrepreneurial ideas and companies all over the world that were founded, grew, have impact, serious and long-standing, and were supported by those organizations. We talk about uh, social entrepreneurship and Mohammed Yunus pops to our minds, the Peace Nobel laureate, father of microfinancing, founder of Grameen Bank, or Gregory Roxon of M Pharma, who's been transforming community pharmacies into healthcare providers in several African countries, or Black Mike Koski, founder of Tom Shoes, for those closer to fashion and retail. That's impressive to say the least, their size, their reach, their impact. And as we discuss impact investing and impact measurement and management, I wish to take this opportunity and share with you uh, just two, three examples out of the seven social entrepreneurs that the People's Trust has supported, which operate for the time being on a smaller scale than the examples earlier. And I feel they will provide a good example, and it might be easier for aspiring social entrepreneurs to relate with them due to their size, due to the current growth stage, and them operating in different sectors. So I'll be talking about Blacklight, a social cooperative enterprise in the services sector founded by persons who are blind. They design and deliver B2B training programs online and on site, seminars, an experiential workshop on the best practices and the appropriate ways to approach a company and service customers that are blind. So ultimately businesses learn how to service an underserved currently specific customer category. Their trained employees have gained skills that are social as much as professional and ultimately Blacklight creates job positions for persons with disabilities. O Orbito Travel is a technology company in the tourism sector, digital travel agency for travelers with disabilities. What they do is they, they survey accommodation facilities, restaurants, tourist attractions, means of transportation, and they are actually relate accurate and relevant information. So on the one hand, travelers with disabilities get to enjoy traveling free of negative uh, surprises and destinations automatically become more accessible just because the correct information, as much is this available, has been related. Finally, we have three quarters, a cyclical economy example, a company that is producing and selling retail and wholesale, high quality bags, backpacks, and accessories of contemporary design. They're actually applying cyclical economy principle they use leftover owning fabric, the fabric of out of the tents in our balconies, and they adhere to zero waste policy in production and in distribution. And in, finally offer a handmade, well-designed quality and durable product. 
I see in these three examples in these three companies and their founders find examples of social entrepreneurship always already having their share in considerable impact and i feel let's say that the human scale for the time being can be an inspiration can be an invitation to future social uh, entrepreneurs now in, in the spirit of us being positive actors in the Greek uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem, we try to be involved, hands-on, supporting any way we can and, and make sense. So you'll often find us in incubators, accelerators, entrepreneurial uh, competitions, where we're discussing, mentoring, judging, evaluating, sometimes funding the awards. There's something relevant and promising on the, that I wish to share uh, as part of, of this experience. Uh, what we've seen is that as entrepreneurs are working on the business plans or preparing business model canvases, required to identify their value proposition, what problem they're solving, there is a growing number of ideas that consider social or environmental issues or, or, or both. They identify business opportunities in serving underserved groups and the aim to innovate by offer either a product, service, a process that promotes equality, inclusivity, or as we had earlier, prevents or even reduces environmental harm. So I would like at this point to go, let's say, back at sustainable finance and uh, make a, a connection with our what was presented so accurately and in detail earlier in our workshop, uh, I'll acknowledge the importance of the ESG criteria introduction, how they've been gaining momentum and acceptance, the effort made by several organizations to streamline common acceptable measurement and reporting principles, uh, while all this being in the light of the challenges, businesses, fund managers, and their investors admit that are presented with when it comes to measuring and reporting. So, of course, in the People's Trust, we also have our KPIs and metrics methodologies. We use them for internal and external reporting. We use them for our own evaluation purposes, year-on-year -year performance, often combining uh, qualitative indexes and qualitative analysis. And, and we as well are presented with similar challenges. Investment in value in the form of our type of financing is pretty straightforward. We do manage to keep track of our beneficiaries, operational status and new job creation. And now we are taking on and we tend to employ techniques and resources to bring more data in assessing our impact on the local economies on our contribution in the national economy, and this will be in different uh, economic accounts, and eventually the subject matter of the day, how our beneficiaries and how we measure against ESG criteria. So concluding, I wish to add a disclaimer. My presentation was, was not AI assisted, what you've just heard were merely my personal and professional views. Uh, what we're trying to achieve in the People's Trust and the Athanasios Laskaridis Charitable Foundation, how we're trying to achieve it and how this is related to sustainable finance and social entrepreneurship. Uh, AI did assist me in following in the following closing statement and I'm happy to close with a part of chat GPT's response around subject, sustainable finance and social entrepreneurship are two interconnected concepts that aim to address social and environmental challenges while also generating economic value. Sustainable finance and social entrepreneurship are two interconnected concepts, but at the end, they also provide frameworks for individuals, organizations, and investors to contribute to positive change and shape a more sustainable and inclusive future. And well, a, 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 fi a final comment, mine again, I see the challenges, let's rise to them. 
the frameworks are existing, the technologies are existing, they are in our toolboxes. Let's act head on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Karidis. Um, I really liked the touch with the chat GDP, but I also liked your personal perspective um, for um, um, towards social entrepreneurship and sustainable finance and the examples that you gave. Um, I had a ch the chance today this morning uh, because we were also organizing an in-person sustainability conference. I had the chance to meet uh, Orbito Travel. It is um, a travel agency for disabled people that promotes accessibility, inclusion, and diversity in the tourism industry. So um, it was magnificent to see the uh, impact that your work has when it comes to niche markets, in quotation marks, um, especially in Greece, where uh, impact investing and sustainable finance, especially in early startups, is not that prominent. And um, any questions? I don't see any questions to our speakers, um, we do have 10 more minutes. So um, shall I give the floor to Mr. Kuvelis uh, for some final remarks and then- No, um, no, it's not about final remarks. It's about oh. a question that came through earlier on, which I okay. think is very interesting and I, I want to go through it. Um, there were some people, notably I have noted Mr. Alexopoulos, and Luca Venza also, who mentioned this, that uh, for startup companies, there are two things. One is that it's quite difficult to actually do a proper assessment for ESG uh, using the tools because they usually don't have the manpower or the funds to do it. Um, and also that in many cases, they see that VCs actually are not asking for this information. I mean, they will mostly look into the financial economic viability uh, the technology readiness level and so on. <clears throat> From my experience, having done this work, specifically working with uh, startup companies and as a, an associate of the University of Cambridge, trying to help them do this, uh, this approach, there are two things. One is that um, in VCs that are looking into sustainability issues, it is expected that uh, a startup will have a strong sustainability component. Uh, if it is just a startup that is doing something that does not have a sustainability component, there will not be much discussion. Uh, there will be a lot of difficulty approaching any VC from what we have seen in, in terms of uh, our collaboration with, uh, with those companies. The second is that we realized that, uh, like many other people, uh, the startups, when they are starting to develop their own business plan and the narrative and, you know, the pitching and the, the uh, proposal that they will do, are not very clear about how their work connects to the sustainability to the sustainable development goals. They very often isolate one or two of them because they might be having a solution, I don't know, related to poverty or to food uh, waste or something like this. And they neglect to connect the rest of the work to the specific targets of the SDGs, which is a very big, very big mistake because usually uh, they will touch on more than one thing. They will provide more than one solutions, and this gives them a much bigger profile in terms of what they do. <clears throat> and it's mostly about how their their operation will be effective and efficient in providing solutions. It's not about how big their negative impact will be. Here, we're trying to measure the, the positive impact that they will have, and they need to be able to incorporate and to build that into their narrative. So this is my um, take, if you like, or my advice into, into startups that are trying to align this, because if they have managed to do this kind of incorporating sustainability and the specific SDGs into what they do, they have done more than half the process of, uh, of preparing for an ESG. The rest can be done by online applications, including our own application uh, that can be provided for really no cost or very, very little cost, which is important because I think that this is also uh, something that needs to be provided through accelerating accelerator programs. Thank you. That's all I want to say about it. Uh, any more guidance or tips to early startups? Because I see that uh, we have a lot of uh, startups uh, from the Acceleration Horizon project that we're running. Luca, uh, Luca Alec, Alexopoulos. Uh, I also see the three quarters, uh, Mr. Pizzani. So any any tips or guidance, uh, Mr. Labrople, uh, Teresa?
Christina, if I may, if I may add, I'm not the, the expert in the panel today to give extra tips to the startups uh, in the sense that uh, uh, our focus and main job is uh, to, to the fund managers, to the financial intermediaries that uh, they will invest into the startup uh, concepts and uh, guide them through in uh, evolving their uh, uh, business model and uh, scale up. Um, of course, uh, Mr. Karidis explained uh, quite thoroughly what is uh, um, that what people's trust uh, has achieved uh, to date and uh, how they have uh, guided through uh, young social entrepreneurs uh, and impact uh, through impact investing uh, what i can say is that uh, uh, Sustainability financing is uh, my closing remark, becomes even more important. Uh, Mrs. Farmaki, of course, uh, elaborated thoroughly their uh, investment model in uh, uh, investing in uh, this uh, sector. Uh, however, uh, no matter whether you invest uh, large scale or uh, small scale, this is an extra step uh, towards uh, uh, what is uh, very important uh, in uh, achieving today. This is uh, my uh, remark. Thank you. Thank you so much. From, uh, from our Teresa? side, yes, yeah, thank you. From our side, what I can say is that um, for us, when we invest, and we invest with different companies as well, right? Different companies, different teams in different sectors. I mentioned forestry, but at the same time, we invest very much also in energy transition, in decarbonization of transportation sectors, in in real estate, in, in different, different uh, asset classes. It is always a very big area of focus to help bring know-how and tools to the teams in how in their journey towards more better reporting and implementing better practices uh, alongside ESG. This is a very fast moving space. It's always relevant on every aspect and uh, it, does, it does take a lot of resources, right? And, and know-how. So for us, we see it as an additional value add in a specific work stream, let's say, that we implement together with everything else in helping the teams that we work with um, bring best practices, right? And, 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 and get better and understand better all these implications. And maybe for those teams as well, this is something that they can specifically look for to their investors when they reach out to raise capital, right? Or do strategic partnerships, because this is definitely an additional significant value add that investors can bring to, to teams. Any final remarks from uh, Mr. Karidis as well? as we are running out of time. I, I would also like to second Mr. Kuveli's comment. Uh, that is true, it's something uh, we, we continuously also come across. Uh, we see at the idea stage of the very, very early startup, sometimes before even having an uh, MPV, uh, startups, tend to focus on one or two aspects that they feel it is the core of the idea. Uh, and at this stage, I, I wanna give them, let's say the, the benefit of the doubt. I'm, I'm sharing, they, they've been sharing with us uh, that there are so many things that they wish to do. Uh, there are so many ideas that they have. They know, many of them know how many areas they can address, but it is, the founders challenges that you know they're driving a seat in their own doing all all the roles uh that actually makes them focus not only in specific esg criteria but in some cases in specific you know business directions or you know coming up with specific uh business skills that's why we see some uh Startups that are very strong in financial, some others in, in marketing, and and so on. So, uh, 
we feel strongly, at least at the startups that we've been working with, that they need uh, support on this very early stage. And this is why it was also mentioned in my presentation that we feel imperative to provide them with an overall business as much as possible, uh, training and support. This is what they lack, great ideas, people coming out of the universities, great ideas, uh, great M M MVPs, but they, they lack, let's say, the overall picture of how to launch a company. Um, this is a problem that we also face in, uh, in the acceleration program that we run and we try to translate all this great research that is being produced, especially in the south of Europe, in all 17 countries, including Turkey, including countries in the Balkan region, to translate all the research into inter entrepreneurship, into spin-offs, into actual startups. Uh, I will be sharing more information about this program and uh, if anyone is interested in applying for the second round that will open in, um, in September 2023. So any final remarks before we go? Mr. Kuvelis? I think I'm good. I think I've, I've taken enough time of this webinar okay. and people have been very patient with me. So no, thank you. So uh, thank you all very much. Thank you to the panelists for contributing to the discussion and sharing their insights from different perspectives. Thank you very much to our attendees. Uh, we will be sharing this presentation online and uh, we're uh, we can always be reached uh, by email. You do have our contact details for extra questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Everyone. Thank you.